Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Hello there, from Brighton. Well, the sun has certainly been shining on the Labour Party conference here, and if that wasn't enough to create a feel-good atmosphere, Jeremy Corbyn's first speech as leader pleased the party. It was a romp through different causes, many dear to Mr Corbyn's heart and to those of his activists, from human rights abuses in Saudi Arabia, to tax credit cuts, to Syrian refugees, with a nod, too, to the self-employed and aspiring homeowners. The word of the day, though, was that one beginning with K. I want a kinder politics, a more caring society. Don't let them reduce you to believing in anything less. The word kinder was used seven times, in fact, as a description of the character trait that Mr Corbyn thinks defines our nation and as an aspiration for a less abusive political style. So I say to all activists, whether Labour or not, Cut out the personal abuse, cut out the cyberbullying, and especially the misogynistic abuse online, and let's get on with bringing real values back into politics. One important point to note, the speech marked a pretty big departure from the politics of the all-powerful leader. He did wear a tie and he did use auto cue, but macho isn't Mr Corbyn's style. He isn't in control of his MPs and he was making a virtue of it. I'm not a leader who wants to impose leadership lines all the time. I do not believe any one of us has a monopoly on wisdom and ideas. We all have ideas and a vision of how things can be better. I want open debate in our party and our movement. I will listen to everyone. Because I firmly believe leadership is about listening. As I say, it went down well in the hall, although these things normally do. Our political editor, Allegra Stratton, was there in that hall for the speech to analyse what kind of Corbyn is emerging at this conference. A great British tradition, queuing patiently for Wimbledon, for the sales, for Glastonbury, and so today for Labour's 18th leader. Just one year ago, Jeremy Corbyn addressed half-packed rooms tucked down far-flung corridors of the party's conference. This year, hundreds wait anxious to get a space in the cavernous main hall, eager to see the moment that Labour's underdog becomes its top dog. So there really is quite a lot of anticipation in this room. It's a special kind of speech, a speech without spin, a politician unplugged, someone who has spent 30 years on the fringes of a conference like this, suddenly catapulted right there to the front. Over the last few weeks, much of Corbyn's project, scrapping Trident, your scepticism, opposing NATO, has been whittled away, but not this. Labour will be challenging austerity. It will be unapologetic about reforming our economy. <laughs> to, challenge, to challenge inequality and protect workers to challenge inequality and protect workers better. But make no mistake, there was spin. Whereas the sections pre-briefed overnight suggested a moderate centre-ground speech, the real thing was studded with well-intentioned left-wing causes and did have a message for the pessimists. If these people were sports reporters writing about a football team, they'd be saying this. They've had a terrible summer. They've got 160,000 new fans. Season tickets are sold out. The new supporters are young and optimistic. I don't know how this club is going to get through this crisis. But was this all authentic, Corbyn? It emerged afterwards that sections had been written by a Labour supporter, sent in four years earlier for Ed Miliband, but rejected by the then Labour leader. No matter. Jeremy Corbyn today got steady waves of ovations, consolidating his grip on the party. Jeremy Corbyn there, gloriously unplugged. I thought he would trim his message a little bit for the audience outside the hall, but not a bit of it. Instead, he took the audience on a tour of all the issues he's cared about over a lifetime. It wasn't, however, 
mainstream politics and it wasn't a platform for government. It wasn't a program for government, was it? No, it was a, it was a new mission. But you needed it to be a, a program no, no, for it government. A, it was a new public and political mission for Labour Party and for the country. You well, listen to Tony Blair and wish you could hear a speech like that. This was far better speech than Tony Blair ever gave. This wasn't the great I am who knows everything. This was a man saying, yes, I'm the leader, but I will work with you, I will listen to you, we will talk together. We'll have a kinder form of politics, not one where people talk about scars in the middle of their back. That was Tony Blair, that's from the past. Do you think it is something that will win over people who voted Conservative in 2015? I think it depends. I think if there, if there are people who don't have any of the problems that he identified and aren't seeing them arise in their own families, then maybe they'll be unmoved. But sadly, there are very many people in this country who either do have those problems or have those problems round the corner. And to them, he spoke. Jeremy Corbyn's speech, five pounds. Corbynistas loved today's speech. But in the last few days, his opponents have used conference committees to restrain Jeremy Corbyn's left-wing project. Many thought the man himself would today move to his appeal. In the end, the 66-year-old returned to a happy place. It's a different time. It's, it's, he's inspirational. Everyone's excited. We're energised. It's just amazing. I don't want to say it wasn't enough, but I think, you know, let's look at what the polls say. Let's look at, as I say, what people in the marginal seats say. I think more does need to come. Um, it's an OK starting point. So how good did you think the speech was? I thought it was a really good speech. I thought it was a powerful speech. I think it was a speech mostly to the party, but then he's only just been elected as leader and he's setting in train a process where the party can engage with the public. As the conference draws to a close, the Corbynistas are upbeat. Yes, they know they've been beaten back on a number of fronts, but they point out that Labour is now an anti-austerity party, and that is quite a shift. But perhaps this year's conference was only ever going to be a rehearsal for the revolution. Corbyn's allies tell me that it's next year's conference where the real battles will be joined. Allegra Stratton there. Well, after the speech, I sat down with the leader of the Unite Union, Len McCluskey, to get his reading on Mr Corbyn, Labour and this conference. Is he feeling good? I thought Jeremy's speech was uh, inspirational. One of the best speeches I've heard at a Labour Party conference for many, many years. Um, and I think coupled with John McDonnell's speech yesterday, which was excellent, there's a new feel and you can sense in the conference hall that people are delighted that there is something different on offer. So uh, yeah, feel good factor all round. What is the pitch to the people who voted Tory in the election who Labour need to get back if they're ever to get back to power? Well, I think the general pitch was one of straight talking, honest politics. I think politicians, uh, their credibility is not particularly high in the public uh, opinion. And I think what Jeremy's done is a great service to all politicians. He's trying to bring integrity back into politics. And so this is a process, this is new. How many times have we heard on the doorstep that they're all the same, they all look the same, they all uh, speak the same, they all put forward the same policies. And I think what you're beginning to see now is something new, something fresh, so an so alternative. But it, it, it is interesting that you say that because some people have listened to the speech and listened to the conference so far and have just slightly felt that it's the party talking to itself rather than talking to the country outside. Well, and you're saying you don't believe that. You think no, I think there's an element of inevitability about that. Jeremy's just won an incredible election. We've never, I've been a member of the Labour Party for 45 years. I've never seen anything like it. All of us have got to take a step back and recognise that something's changing and take it from there together. Winning must matter to you and your members. Trade union bill, you don't like that. Yeah. Intervention in Redcar, a crisis, an industrial crisis in Redcar on Teesside at the moment. Yeah. There's no intervention, you want intervention. No. If you had won the last election, yes. you would have got closer to your way. Yes, I mean, there's no doubt that power matters. Uh, now, it's the big argument about power without principle means nothing, but principles without power. So that's the challenge that Jeremy now faces. Uh, 
Myself personally, I've always operated on the basis of principal pragmatism. You have core principles that you should never move away from, but you have to be sufficiently pragmatic to respond to the given uh, situation that you find yourselves in. And that's the challenge. How can you win Scottish uh, working class voters back to Labour whilst at the same time attracting Tory working class voters on the south coast and the home counties. It's a huge challenge, but I think I feel optimistic. I feel optimistic for the first well, time. Well, no, time. you felt optimistic before the general election as well, didn't you? You thought you were going well, to win that. Well, I re well, I really feel optimistic right. this more time. Optimistic. I feel more thing. optimistic. You used the phrase principled pragmatism. John McConnell used the phrase, McDonnell used the phrase. Uh, I, pragmatic idealism, I think, was his yeah. order of idealism, pragmatism. Yeah. Yeah. He used a similar phrase. Are we seeing at this conference, help me out here, are we seeing what was a very ideological leadership campaign for Jeremy Corbyn morph into something a little bit more mainstream and a little bit more pragmatic? I think, so. I think we're perhaps seeing a, a, a recognition by both Jeremy and John that they are now leaders of, uh, a, a, of, a, of a political party. I mean, when you're an individual MP, and Jeremy's been an individual MP for 30 years, and he's been able to effectively vote in accordance with his conscience, and he's always been an incredibly principled guy in that sense. When you become a leader, things have to change. I myself, for example, have been a unilateralist all my life, but as soon as I became General Secretary of UNICE, that finished because my responsibility is to my members and my union's policy. So um, you dropped your principles and you stuck with what the I, kind of the, the, I the moved, voting members I, I moved into the pragmatic uh, right. arena that if I wanted to be leader of my union, I had to understand the different demands from the different sections. And, uh, and I think Jeremy will begin to grow into that position. And uh, you say more, Fevin, into, well, yeah, maybe that is what's happening. And he's only been in for a fortnight, so let's give him a little bit more time. Let's suppose he leads Labour into the next election. And let's suppose it does not go well and he doesn't win the next election. Mm -hmm. Will you then accept Labour needs to be a different party and move perhaps back to the right and that socialism is not a, a way to win elections in Britain? Or will you be saying, we didn't try hard enough, it wasn't pure enough, it was the right argument but the wrong guy, all these kinds of things you hear every time there's a left-wing attempt. To, to Evan, I promise you, in five years' time, right. come and ask me that question and I'll give you the answer. Len McCluskey, thank you very much. Well, let's talk now with Peter Kellner, the president of the Polster YouGov, Jonathan Friedland, executive editor of The Guardian, and the journalist and Corbyn fan, uh, Ellie May Hagen. I don't know if that's how you like to be described, Ellie. But look, Ellie, the question, what was there for the voters outside the conference hall, for Tories? Anything? Well, I mean, you know, as, as was discussed in your VT there, obviously the, the main purpose of the debate was to shore up support for Corbyn's base. And I think that considering that he has, you know, he's had, there's been whisperings in the PLP against him, I think that was a wise decision because his mandate is what's keeping him there. But in terms of what is there for Tory voters or swing voters, um, I think the stuff on uh, self-employment was really powerful because there's been a huge spike in self-employment since 2008. But actually, uh, the average wages of the self-employed have plummeted by around 20%. So that's a huge constituency of people who are suffering from insecure wages and um, you know, insecurity in low wages, I'm sorry. And uh, Corbyn is laying the foundations to appeal to those people. So that was an attempt to broaden the coalition to sort of beyond the usual suspects to a kind of new, new groups. Well, yes, I would thought. say it was less yeah. than an attempt, but m more of laying the foundations. And right. I think the other um, element that I, I noticed uh, was the stuff about mental health. And, you know, obviously we don't talk about that much with our friends and family because there's a lot of stigma attached. But I think all of us have known someone who suffered from mental health issues and has not been able to access the help mm. that they need. And I do think that will appeal to a lot of people who've experienced those problems mm. in their lives. Did you hear much for Tory voters, Jonathan? Not much. I heard the word aspiration, and I thought that was clever, that he talked about everyone. It was in the context of school education reform, and he said that he wants aspiration for everybody, everybody's child, not just those sort of lucky few. And I thought that was since how charged and loaded that word became, where people thought it was somehow code for, you know, the full Blairite project, he wanted to take back that word. I also clocked the reference to uh, the self-employed, and I think some of the stuff around home ownership. Yeah, he mentioned well, home ownership a couple did. of times. And, yeah, you yeah. know, there was a time when some on the left would have thought that was a very bourgeois 
bourgeois sort of aspiration, but instead he spoke to that. And so I think uh, those were there, but they were the exceptions. The thrust of the speech absolutely was to the party and to make sure those people in the hall and the wider Labour family uh, felt that he was their guy. Uh, and I think that spoke to the whole larger project of the speech, which I found sort of odd, which was that his big aspiration was really to change politics rather than government. He talked about campaigning, that we'll campaign in a different way. That The Labour Party vision that he imagined was a Labour Party in every town where people come and meet and talk politics. It wasn't actually about changing the way the country is governed, but the way politics in the country is conducted, and that's a different goal. Right. Peter, I mean, too early for polling uh, results on... I think it's too early for polling <laughs> results on the... We're speech. out there as, as, as we speak. speak. Right, you can't give us early glimpses. But what did you feel about the way it was pitched? I mean, was this just, I need to consolidate the position of the party, I need to make the party feel good, perhaps, because every year for the last 20 years, someone's come along to tell them the difficult decisions, the t compromises that have to be made, and it's just nice once every couple of decades to get someone to tell you there are no difficult decisions in this uh, of course. Look, I I if we were five weeks from a general election, I would have said this was pretty thin gruel. This is not going to win many votes. But we're nearly five years from a general election. So, as Ellie says, we're seeing the foundations being laid. And I thought it was very striking, apart from the particular points that Ellie and Jonathan made, with which I agree, that the, the tone, he, this big push to say, let's do politics differently. I think that's essentially wonderful. I hope he succeeds. But, and it's an important but, I think that takes you only to first base. It gets him a hearing, it gets him perhaps past some of the media abuse. But beyond that, he's got to succeed where Ed Miliband spectacularly failed, in persuading voters, one, that he'd be an effective Prime Minister, and secondly, that the Labour government would run the economy effectively. And I don't think they're anywhere near achieving either of those two objectives. There is another drawback as well to this idea that it's five years and he can play the long game. That's true and he could just lay the foundations. That presumes though that impressions are not set right now ah, in this early, that's, early Well, window. that's very, very interesting. Are impressions mm. set very early, Peter? Because I think there's some... Is there data on this about how, how we come to judge politicians? Well, we, almost everything... Uh, we judge whether we, when we meet people for the right. first time, we, we get impressions in the first few seconds, let alone minutes, hours or, or, or days. And, and yes, it is, I think, and, and perhaps this is the key to why Jeremy Corbyn was talking about representing British values, because his first obvious need is to get away from the uh, allegation that he's a left-wing uh, extremist and he's part of the mainstream of British discourse. Um, and we'll see how successful he is. I mean, it's, if I were advising him, which I promise you I'm not, uh, I would have said, yes, you've got to reposition yourself in the mainstream of the British political debate. That's what he's trying to do. But, you know, one thing I would say, though, is I think that, you know, I, I totally agree that first impressions are very important. But if there's one thing that we've learned from the last 12 months, it's that politics will change very quickly and very unpredictably. I'm sure that none of us, well, I certainly speak for myself, that if six months ago you told me that uh, Jeremy Corbyn would be leader of the Labour Party and there'd be a Tory majority, I'd, I'd ask if you were mm. feeling all right, you know, and yet here mm. we are. And I think that... It's definitely volatile. Well, yes. because, of, because of what Ellie says, it means that people like us should hesitate and be humble before we mm. start taking out lines from the political rule book. The political rule book says first impressions matter. Mm. A party leader only gets to make a debut speech once, mm. right? So this was his debut. He needed, I think, to break, though, through the perceptions that Peter's mentioned and to do something very eye-catching. Mm. I was expecting a riff on the lines that would say, you know, is it extreme mm. to want a good school for every child? Mm. Is it extreme to want your son oh, okay. or daughter to have a home? Yeah. You know, that would have broken through, I think, a bit more. But but, mate, you know, I say clearly, it may be that people like us don't know anything anymore and that, you know, the rule book was torn up by the Corbyn surge, by the SNP, and maybe all the old rules don't matter. And similarly with his style, you know, the, the very, I think you used the right word, very non-macho style, this very mm. diffident entrance, very humble. The speech was not mm. structured but, like but, a normal but, speech. It wasn't, didn't play any of the but, normal but, but, rules. But, but, maybe that's what works. But, but this is why I think it's important to say first, the only one debut speech. Neither him today nor John McDonnell, the Shadow Chancellor yesterday, said anything at all about the need for a strong, vibrant, successful, profitable private sector. I think the only time he used the word profit today was in criticism, saying we put people before profits. Mm -hmm. Now, what Corbyn's critics will say, fairly or unfairly, is that the only way a progressive government can spend more on welfare, on 
hospitals, on schools, is if you have a really dynamically successful private sector. And I think a lot of his critics will say there is nothing in his record and nothing he has said today which suggests he understands that in the least. You, you, sorry. No, go on. Uh, no, well, I, I think what I wanted to say is um, I come from a background, I come from North Wales, and uh, I don't come from a, a background where I know a, pe a lot of people who are into politics. Very few of my friends and family growing up were into politics. And recently I went home to visit friends and family and I asked a lot of them, what do you think of Jeremy Corbyn? And the most common answer I got is, who is Jeremy Corbyn? And that's because actually most normal people, you know, what Jonathan was saying, they don't sit watching 50-minute speeches by opposition leaders. You know, I don't think that people view politics in those terms. I think that what the Tory victory showed us is people get a general sense of a party. They get an idea of a message. Right, but an what idea sense of are we getting of Jeremy Corbyn, would you say, at this point? Well, at the moment, I think that, um, I, you know, I think that people are getting a sense that he's something different, that he's something interesting. That, you know, that they're quite wary, but they're also curious. Right. I think there's everything to play for is at the, the moment. Is the, is the big call, is the big judgment now over the next few years, whether he's going to look different and open-minded and leadership is listening, or that is going to look weak. And I just wonder whether that is the gamble. Well, that I think might... there's definitely a market for the earnest, the sincere, the committed. And that riff passage in the end, the one we actually discovered that was sent in by this blogger, um, where he said, you don't have to take what you're given. I think there will be a huge audience for that who feel a kind of rage. It reminded me a bit of the Peter Finch character in Network. You know, we're mad as hell and we're not going to take yeah. it anymore. Yes. And here's this older man channeling that message. I think there could be an audience for that as there was for Nigel Farage but, but... Brothers. But... The, if you completely tear up the old rule book and you don't actually offer, for example, a speech with a structure and an argument you can listen to, it's very, it gets risky that people in the end will just yeah. think he's a bit... But, 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 there's a, but there's an audience, but are the votes, and it still has to convert right. into people saying, what does it do to my job, my prices, we need to leave it my language? We need to leave it there. Thanks all very much indeed. I've been getting